If any of you are interested, if you've seen this before, uh, come find me afterwards. I'll give you a promo code for like 20% off. I think this take us, uh, it'll save you like 100 bucks. Um, it's gonna be great. Um, as far as my background, I, it's cool to be speaking at University of Illinois Chicago here because uh, I went to and failed out of the University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to go speak there about this stuff a couple times and that's just been amazing. Because um, I, I failed out because uh, you know, I got super depressed and um, didn't know that there was a term for that back then. I, I didn't know that's what it was. And um, when I first got to school, my first couple of years, I did pretty well. Uh, mostly because I had just taken some advanced classes in high school and I was kind of smart enough that I could fake my way through things and you know, cram the night before the test. Um, but every single semester I'd sit down and I'd say, you know, this semester I want to try really hard. Like this semester I want to go to all my classes, I want to keep, and, uh, what do you call it, a scheduler or whatever. Uh, and uh, an assignment book, I don't even know. Um, and uh, and like, I want to do a little bit of homework every night, I'm not going to wait till the last minute, and that would last like two weeks. And and it just got a little bit worse every semester. The classes got harder. Turns out you can't learn linear algebra the night before the final. Uh, I tried twice, and uh, it didn't work out either time. Um, and finally, like my fifth year, you know, there's a lot of people they, they fail out of school, but at least they do it in the first couple of years. Like I did it the exact wrong way. I, I did all five years, and finally failed out. It's just not going to happen. But going into that fifth year, I broke up with a girlfriend. Um, I all my friends had graduated in four years, so I was pretty much alone. I moved in an apartment by myself for the first time, um, and you know, my combination of my debt, my parents' debt, to pay for school, and it was pretty obvious I wasn't going to get my degree, and I didn't know how to tell them that, um, and so I just got super depressed, and uh, I started sleeping like 12, 16 hours a day, and what seems to be most common, I think one of the hardest parts about mental illness is that it often forces you to hide from things. And so again, those, I mean, everyone kind of shared kind of your stuff like, that. thank you so much for that because what was, what I found, at least in my case, is that it's the hiding that is the worst part. And it got so bad that I even had a friend one day come over to my apartment and he had sent me a couple emails just checking in on me that last year because we worked together and he knew that I hadn't been to work. I just stopped going to class, stopped going to work. And he, he calls me, he sends me a couple emails, I ignore him. And then he calls me, and it's in the afternoon on a weekday, and I'm still in bed. And I ignore it, and I scroll over, I go back to sleep. And he calls me back again, and I ignore it again. And then I hear like a knock on my door a few minutes later. And when you're forgetful like I am, there's these certain like life maintenance tasks that you just accept aren't going to happen. And back then, locking my doors was one of them. Because uh, I would always forget my keys and then get locked out, and, and then so I was like, oh, it's just easy. like, what are the chances someone just walks around trying door knobs anyway? Um, well, my friend decided to walk up to my place and try my door knob, uh, and I just panicked. Like, how do you face someone after they sent you a couple of emails and, and called you, and then like, how do you, you know? And so I, I just kept hiding, and at the time I slept on this pretty cheap bed, is on one of those um, metal bed frames that has the casters on it and I had rolled a couple feet away from the wall. And so I just slid right into that gap. And I just pulled the covers over my head, and I just held my breath. And Bill walked into my apartment, and he pokes his head in my bedroom, and then he pokes his head in my office, and then he just walks out. And it wasn't actually until about last year I sent Bill a video of this talk, and I was like, hey man, like, that's what was going on in my life back then. And I, just, I started hiding from everyone. Like, I ended up failing out of school, I go, but I don't know how to tell my parents, and so I just lie to them and tell them that I graduated. And it was so frustrating because like, I, I recognized that I had certain privileges, right? Like I, I started programming when I was a kid. For some reason, my parents got a computer in the house pretty young, even though there's no reason to. And, um, you know, I just knew I, was, you know, I could go to college, and I knew I was smart enough to do work. And, uh, and it seemed like whenever I finally sat down to do the work, you know, it was easier for me than it was for a lot of my other friends. The hard part, like, was sitting down to do it. Like, that was ten times harder. And, and I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And one night, in in just frustration, I did the thing that you do when you have questions about life that have no answers. Uh, and I just Googled it. 
and I Googled chronic procrastination. And it wasn't too long before I started reading about ADD. And, you know, I had always kind of joked that maybe I had ADD, but I never really meant it, right? Because, like, ADD is what you say you have when you're just lazy. You know, it's just an excuse, right? Like it's a made-up thing for people who don't want to try hard. And, uh, and I just, I believed all that. And, but then I, through the Googles, I discovered a couple books. And I went to Barnes and & Noble, and, and uh, I think those are still around. And I found this awesome book. If any of you are wondering about this, uh, this is one of the best books I've read on ADHD or ADD, um, called Driven to Distraction. And I'm like reading this book and like simultaneously want to jump for joy, but also kind of break down crying because um, all these stories are just resonating with me. You know? These stories of like people who are talented but leading lives of feels like not living up to their potential. Uh, this other book I read was called The Edison Gene by this guy named Tom Hart. And he had this theory that ADD was a genetic trait and that it led back to tens of thousands of years ago when we had uh, folks who would be more of the hunting persuasion where they're going out in a new territory every day and they have to constantly scan the horizon and they have to be able to rapidly shift, the, shift, shift their focus to whatever the new thing is that comes in to view. And then you had farmers who need to be meticulous and do the same thing every single day. And he's like, it's not that one of these two are better than the other, it's just that over time, we had more use for the farmers, and the hunters would get killed off more, uh, more frequently than if they would be the ones who go to war first. You know? I don't know if it's true or not, but it at least made sense to me. And one of the things that, that really was most encouraging to me is he said that you know, if you were to take someone who has ADD and you put them into a high pressure situation, they perform really, really well, right? Like they can perform better than others. But if you take someone without it, they would call them the difference between non-linear thinkers and people with ADD and linear thinkers. You drop a linear thinker in that same high pressure situation, they'll exhibit all the same symptoms that someone who has ADD would exhibit. So they will have a hard time focusing. You know, like they will procrastinate and put off making decisions. And so what these books did was two things. One, it gave me a reason that was something more than just me being a lazy bastard. Right? Like, and, that, and that's all I had to go on for so long, like, was just the fact that I was wasting these talents. The second thing is it started to make it kind of feel like a superpower, which is pretty awesome, you know? Like, sure, I was kind of vulnerable to certain things, you know? But uh, there were a lot of times when I just felt like I could fly. Like, there were a lot of times when I just felt like I could go fast. My brain was working really, really, really well. And these books kind of helped me explain that. And so it still took me about a year but I went to go see uh, a therapist. And, uh, and it took me a year because I needed to get over the stigma. Like I felt like I needed to pick myself up by my bootstraps and try harder and all that good stuff. Um, and I go see her and I explain what I have and I take these tests and, and she comes back and she says, you absolutely have ADD, like you're off the charts. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not only do I have this thing that only like 10% of the population have, but, uh, but I'm off the charts, you know? Like I'm, <laughs> I'm an overachiever of the underachievers. And, uh, and she goes, but I think you might also have type two bipolar. And I was like, no, uh, I'll take the ADD. <laughs> and uh, you can keep the bipolar. Uh, so that's what crazy people have. And I, I didn't know anything about bipolar at the time other than you know, probably what you see in the movies. You know, it's also called manic depression. You'll cycle through periods of mania, which are like the good parts, right? Like that's when you really feels like you're flying. In fact, a lot of people who have bipolar won't get treatment for it because they don't want to give up the mania. Like when I uh, finally got like real treatment for it, I was describing the symptoms, and my doctor was like, "That's mania." I was like, "Yes. How do I get that all the time?" <laughs> um, but then you know, there's the down cycles, and in type one bipolar, there's a type called rapid cycling where you can go through the highs and lows rapid, you know, even in the course of a day. For my bipolar, um, it, the cycles are more elongated and I don't get quite as depressed and I have more hypomania as opposed to full-blown mania. Um, and so what it would feel like for me is, is weeks of lethargy and despair just punctuated by these moments of, you know, where it would feel like I was flying, you know, where I could stay up all night. But then, and I stay up all night, I have all these, you know, creative ideas. But then it always happened where like, then something would happen and I would just plummet back down. And I would just fall back down and I'd feel like I'd fall into this hole and then I was trying to climb out of that hole. 
and it would just feel like trying to crawl up this gravel pit where it didn't seem to matter how hard I tried, I, would just, I couldn't get traction, I just keep sliding further and further and further down. And this would happen, this kept happening for about two years. I, I was in denial about the bipolar for two years. And um, I started taking meds for the ADD, um, and they helped a lot, they helped me focus really well. Like first time I took it, like 15 minutes later, I'm like, holy shit, is this what everybody else feels like? Because I, I can make a list, I can execute on the list, I, I spent like two hours cleaning my house, it was great. But they would also just make me focus a lot on how impressed I was. And so when things got bad, they got really bad. Um, and I kind of bounced around, I worked for a consulting company here in Chicago, and, um, and it was my dream job, and you know, I, I did pretty well the first few months, and then I just started dropping the ball all the time. And the owner of the company was a good friend of mine living on the street, and, uh, and one day, you know, after like weeks of not showing up to the office until noon or, or later, um, there's this big project that was due, and I had just not shown up to work, and so, he just walks over to my apartment to check on me, and I still don't lock my doors. And so once again, I wake up to a friend walking into my apartment, waking me up, and being like, hey Greg, are you here? And I just couldn't hide anymore. And what I finally had to realize was that I had been telling myself, you know, I don't know how to fix this, so I'm just going, to contain the damage to myself. You know, I'm just gonna make sure that nobody else gets hurt. And what I finally had to realize is that it just doesn't work that way. You know, like if you have friends, if you have family, if you have coworkers, they suffer through this stuff with you too. And so I called and I set up an appointment with a psychiatrist that day. I was actually really fortunate. Uh, I met my wife that same day. Uh, like, what are the odds there? Um, <laughs> it's actually this. I, she, we were, I had like chat logs from like a couple weeks afterwards, and, and I'm like, hey, listen, like, I really enjoy hanging out with you, but I got diagnosed with bipolar last week, uh, and it wasn't because I was at one of the high points. Um, so if you want to keep hanging out, that's awesome. But like, I don't have plans, and I don't, I can't tell you on Wednesday if I have enough emotional energy to leave the room on the house on Friday. Um, and she was amazing, and she was like, kept hanging out. And, been married for five years now. It's, it's been pretty awesome. And so uh, I also go to the doctor and, and I you know, see a psychiatrist three weeks later and, and he's like, you know, I tell him the story and he said, you know, you're really fortunate we've got these meds. They're really great. Uh, it's called Lamictal. I take these every day now. And, and he says, uh, you know, there's almost no side effects. Uh, actually, I guess there is this one side effect. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, uh, someone ends up getting uh, a life threatening rash inside their anus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I was like, well, uh, I said to him, uh, I'm pretty sure if I get a life-threatening rash inside my anus, I'm still going to be depressed. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I didn't, it's been like eight years now, um, but every time I get an itch, though, I'm like, <laughs> is today the day? Uh, but it hasn't happened, I think, I'm pretty sure I'm in the clear now. Um, and so I am just like incredibly fortunate here. You know, like I, I mean, pretty much everything after having bipolar was best case scenario, right? Like I met my wife, I had a job, I could program, so I was like pretty employable because our field's pretty tolerant of weird behavior, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, I had health insurance, right? Like I met my wife, I had parents who served as kind of a backstop for me when there were a couple times when I had to call them to help out with rent. Um, I easily could have ended up homeless. Um, you know, not to mention like I'm a white guy, like which just makes life way easier. I've heard that called like playing life on easy mode. Um, and so it's just like everything was going well for me, right? A lot of folks who have what I have aren't as fortunate. It's estimated that five percent of the population has bipolar. Um, one in three will attempt suicide at some point in their life, and ten to twenty percent die from it. Um, it actually has a higher mortality rate than some forms of cancer. And so this kind of like begs the question of why am I speaking at a, a developer conference about this stuff? But I think that from everyone going around and sharing their story, um, if you weren't convinced prior, it's probably not terribly hard to convince you that this stuff shows up a lot 
in our community. And I don't know of any study, so please don't take this as fact. But my general theory is, my hypothesis is, that there's certain characteristics of mental illness that make one more likely to end up as a developer than, say, as an accountant. So these are some cherry-picked symptoms of ADHD <coughs> and, and bipolar. Right? Totally chosen for a fact. A lot of other symptoms. Don't read this and be like, I have bipolar and ADD. Like, go see a doctor a little bit. Uh, but these are some of the things that are common. So like hyper-focusing. So, you know, I'd say, y'all probably know what that is. You probably have all experienced. You know, it's hard to get started, but once you do, you can just work for 12 hours, the whole world blurs away, and you forget to eat, you forget to go to the bathroom. There's racing thoughts, which is exactly what it sounds like. There's pressured speech, which is when the racing thoughts try to come out through the small hole of your mouth. There's irregular sleep patterns. So especially onset insomnia, it's hard to fall asleep at night. It's impossible to wake up in the morning. Uh, there's social isolation. Uh, there's thoughts of grandiosity. You know, thinking that the rules don't apply to you, thinking that, I don't know, thinking that you could change the world. Um, if you are a young adult or an adolescent and you're struggling with some of these symptoms, finding software development will probably feel a lot like coming home to you. You know, like we accept the unaccepted here. You know, we, we will bring in the socially isolated. Um, we will tolerate irregular sleep patterns. And we actually put out beacons to the rest of the world asking the people who have thoughts of grandiosity to come join us. There's this old Apple commercial. I'm not sure that this ever aired in the speakers. Mayor, I think you'll be able to hear this. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. If, if mental illness causes you to do one thing, it's to think differently, <laughs> <laughs> by definition. And, and it, it allows you, like, that we know that um, some of these conditions correlate with increased intelligence. They, uh, correlate with increased risk tolerance, you know, like a, a person who is a, an entrepreneur, definitely, like, there's, at, there's certain studies around that say they're more likely to have uh, depression and bipolar than the general population. Um, and in fact, a lot of the folks that are well known in our industry have gone through this stuff. The grandfather of computer science, Alan Turing, committed suicide, as I'm sure most of you know. And of course, there were a lot of political stuff around that as well. But, um, and then just a couple years ago, uh, we lost Aaron Schwartz as well. Um, and in fact, in 2006, Aaron Schwartz wrote this. Um, it's from his blog. If you ever want to read the entire thing, it's from a, a poster, an essay he wrote called Sick. And he says, surely there have been times when you've been sad. Perhaps a loved one has abandoned you or a plan has gone horribly awry. Your face falls, perhaps you cry, you feel worthless. You wonder whether it's worth going on. Everything you think about seems bleak. The things you've done, the things you hope to do, the people around you. You want to lie in bed and keep the lights on. Depressed mood is like that, only it doesn't come for any reason, and it doesn't go for any either. Depression causes nearly half of all disability. It affects one in six and explains more current unhappiness and poverty. And sadly, depression, like other mental illnesses, especially addiction, is not seen as real enough to the investment and awareness of conditions like breast cancer, which affects one in eight, or AIDS, which affects one in 150. And there is, of course, the shame. The shame is what's killing us. Like the shame and the stigma around mental illness are the reason why people don't get help. You know, there's no cure for mental illness, but we've got really good treatments, right? Like, 
got good meds, therapy is super effective. But the reason why our friends and our colleagues don't get to that treatment is because of the shame and the stigma, right? Like, we just have different rules for the way that we think of illnesses of the brain than we do for anything that happens below the neck. Like we even we use different words for these things, or different phrases. Like if you know, we will say things like, "Oh, it's just all in your head," right? Or like, have you thought about like have you tried just like being happier? You know, like <laughs> have you, maybe you just need to try harder. Or you know, it's, it's common if you tell someone you're taking meds for something, they'll be like, "You know, aren't you afraid you're just using that as a crutch?" Um, out of curiosity, how many people here have actually used crutches before? Have like hurt your leg or something like that, right? Like, crutches are actually like, pretty fucking helpful, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like, you, like why, why is using a crutch a bad thing? You know, if you're injured, they're they are they're super helpful. Like, they they allow you to go out and live your life, you know. And and in some cases, they're temporary. In some cases, they're permanent. But it's way easier to stay on the couch than it is to use crutches and get out and live your life. There's also some people who can do some pretty sweet things on crutches. <laughs> so the fact that you're using crutches doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still have an awesome life, right? It doesn't mean that you can't try harder necessarily, that you're inherently like, somehow we've come to believe that using it as a crutch is a, is a euphemism for being lazy. Like, just because you're using crutches doesn't mean that you're being lazy. It's actually pretty hard. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just really interesting because of the stigma that's associated with these things, of how our society views them as different. You know, we don't treat people who need glasses to correct vision problems, like problems with their eyes, as being lazy because they're not trying harder to see. But we will treat people who have problems with their brain that way. Um, and for a long time, I didn't want to accept this, right? Like I said, it took me a year after kind of self-diagnosing with ADD to go see a therapist. It took me two years after that, that, that professional mental health um, counselor told me I had bipolar. Two years later, for me to actually get treatment for it. Because I didn't want to A, admit that I was broken, B, that I couldn't do it on my own, or C, like I really, really didn't like the idea of taking meds. Right? Like I was afraid that the meds would screw with my brain. You know, I was afraid that they would screw with my creativity because uh, for the most part, um, like the way that my brain worked. And in fact, they, they did mess with my creativity. Uh, I am an order of magnitude more creative today than I was 10 years ago. If you judge creativity by how much you actually create. It used to be that I would have all these ideas running around in my head and I thought they were super special and they were amazing ideas. But the fact is like creativity means that you have to take those ideas out of your head and put them into the world and like ship stuff. Like I wasn't being creative back then, I was just thinking a lot. You know, and today, now that I take the meds, I can be, you know, for the last eight years that I've been on, you know, I've, I've learned how to be a lot more like the tortoise in the hair, right? Like, I've learned how to have, to do a little bit every day and to gradually chip away at the goals and to be able to, to push out and to ship stuff actually into the world to create more. Um, and so, you know, for those of you, like, again, I just want to thank you. I'm going to wrap up here uh, in just a minute, but. I thank you first off for just like sharing so much. Like just the fact that you're sitting there and willing to share and say this out loud, I think puts you so far ahead. And I really do believe that like the first step that we have in, in helping folks in this industry and our friends and colleagues is to go first. Like what I found, I'm just like, you know, the, the, the two years I've been doing this, especially when I first started, every time before I get up on stage, I'd be like, there's this little voice in the back of my head that's like, don't do this. Like, what are you doing? They will shun you. You know, they, why are you burdening them with your problems? Like, are you ever going to get a job again if you stand up on stage and admit that you have this stuff? Um, and uh, and that's not to say that, like, again, white dude, like, 
got really fortunate uh, with employers, but uh, that's worked out well for me. In fact, like now I get paid in part to talk about this stuff. Like I have my dream job now, and no small part because I love these things. But, but I've never, I've never had anyone react negative, right? Like, and I've just been blown away. I think I grossly underestimated the the empathy and understanding of our developer community. And I grossly underestimated how many people were actually, if they're not going through something like this themselves, then they have a friend or a colleague who has to. And if there's some of you who are suffering through this stuff and you know, maybe it feels like things are never going to get better, you know, like, I just want to tell you that by definition, your brain, if you have a mental illness, is lying to you at times, right? Like your brain is taking in the world, is running it through a faulty analysis process, and it's coming up with wrong results. And when I was in college, I would tell myself that there was no hope, that it would never get better. Like I had nights when I was praying there that God wouldn't wake me up, you know? And, and I, I felt like I could never, you know, all those times I was like, this time's gonna be different, this time I'm gonna do a little bit more every day, I'm gonna be consistent. I, I just swore like, I would never be like that. And a couple years ago, I ran my first marathon, which is like the definition of the sort of thing that takes a whole bunch of steady progress over time, right? Like, I thought the hardest thing in the world for me was waking up before noon. And like anything before nine just seemed ludicrous. And this has helped in large part because we have a daughter now, but for the last few months, I've been trying this experiment where I get up at 4.30 every morning. And it's just been incredible, like I get up, I'm able to like, you know, I have, take a shower, have some coffee, and I sit down, and I'm able to do 60, 90 minutes of work on like the most important task of the day. No matter what happens the rest of the day, I know I've made a little bit of progress there, right? And, um, and then, you know, like I said, like I, I just, my life was such a mess 10 years ago. Like I, I, was, I got my electric shut off, my heat shut off. Like I thought, like I'd be unemployed, I could never bring someone else into my life. And, now we have a 16-month-old daughter who is just like amazing. And so I never ever would have believed that it was possible to get better, right? Like I wanted to die. And so I just encourage all of you who, if anyone here is going through or feeling the same way, like just know that your brain is lying to you. And I wholeheartedly believe that like the first step on that path to getting better is to just talk about it. So you have a bunch of people in this room who share about what they're going through. Find someone here, chat about the stuff. If you don't have anyone else to chat with or you just want to chat with me, here's my contact info. Um, I send out emails sometimes about this stuff. Um, there'll be some more resources up there at devsanddepression.com. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So I just, there's a lot of sessions going on. I really appreciate y'all being here. I'm going to hang around for the next several hours. I didn't want to talk to you. Thank you all. And he's probably spoken more about this stuff. He gives a talk called Open Source Mentor. He's probably spoken more about it than anyone in the industry. And uh, yeah, the, he's running a survey right now that I think he does every year or so. But just check out Open. I, I, the last email I sent out was links to his stuff. Um, but oh, just Google Open Sourcing Mental Illness. And he's got awesome resources on there. It's just a great, great dude. So, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Or, or, but I think the dot com for uh, all right, I want to. I think we have the room for a minute. If anyone has any questions, we're asking finally like, the questions go better. Not the big group. So, uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, here's cool. Otherwise, we can be around. Yeah.